guys just go look in the eyes and then the autistic ones go. It is what it is. He's gonna do his stupid video. His audience will fucking see it. Some of his audience will go, yeah, fuck Mersh! And the other half are gonna go, I don't know who this loser is. People are gonna watch it. He's gonna call me gay on the internet. I'm gonna go back to my show calling people gay on the internet. Nobody's lives are really gonna change after this. From day one, I've always been like, look, watch Porcelain's videos. They're hilarious. Like, he's done great work on a lot of these dudes. But he's also a fucking dick. You know what I mean? So that's pretty much the explanation of it. Let's say I melt the fuck down on the internet, right? Who's, who's gonna care? Look, he's got good numbers. He'll put up some numbers with it. But my prediction right now, and I'm already gonna say this, is that, and it's also me admitting that I'm a nobody, this will be like the least watched porcelain video of all time you know chris chan fucked his mom right we gonna do anything about that or oh, we just letting that one slide are we gonna do something that actually draws new viewers because you're not you're not gonna get caught up in some kind of merch algorithm that's gonna fly you to fame Be careful what you wish for, it might just come true. The commonly used idiom, a variation of the Yiddish curse may you get what you wish for, serves as a stark warning of the unintended consequences from a seemingly idealistic outcome. Arguably popularised in modern culture by the classic deal with the devil cinematic trope, the actualization of our most self-indulgent fantasies can often achieve the exact opposite of its intended conclusion. Michael Sheely, better known by his self-awarded radio moniker Mersh, encapsulates the expression to near perfection. With a story spanning the opposing poles of couch-surfing homelessness to the lucrative financial bounties of e begotry one could assume this as one of your classic rags-to-riches adventures. And as a self-employed entrepreneur boasting a giant killing empire with YouTube's fattest dissident podcast Revenge of the Sis, it certainly appears that this notorious comedic outlaw had finally hit the big time. But as we traverse the Terrasburg-infested waters of a strabismic grifter, Mersh's current utopian delusion bears all the hallmarks of your quintessential living nightmare. Mersh's tumultuous tale begins with an ill-fated foray into the world of stand-up comedy, and with the sort of outrageously offensive set-boasting references ranging from dead babies and date rapists to the AIDS epidemic, he appeared perfectly primed for a seat at the cellar table. Although the most notable elements to Mersh's career in comedy has to be his eclectic choice of clothing. Having not so carefully crafted his confusing range of tasteless aesthetics, Mersh would seamlessly glide from turning up at Joker's Wild Club dressed as some council estate Anglo chav, to prancing around Carolina Beach dressed head to toe as the word cringe. And when not squeezing his stubby extremities into a pair of fingerless leather gloves, or wrapping his amorphous torso into yet another badly fitting sports coat, you could have found mid 2000 Mersh at the palm room wearing what looked like a sleeveless dress shirt over some trashy printed tea. But it was the fedora perched perilously on his receding scalp that would truly stamp a huge reddit seal of approval on this embarrassing outfit. And with the sort of outdated material packed with pedocentric scraps from Jim Norton's cutting room floor, it's no surprise his fledgling career in comedy failed at the first hurdle. Anybody here really hammered make some noise? Who's drinking irresponsibly tonight? You didn't drink as much as I did, fucker. I am hardcore, man. I drink a lot, dude. My liver looks like a dead two-year-old Dominican kid. I'm not kidding. You. How is it that somebody who's already waddling around because they look a bit pudgy is wearing pants that seem to be three sizes too big? It's almost at thigh level. It looks like he's wearing diapers. Like if you go to thigh level, it's like a weird jean version of hammer pants. I'm trying to understand like the mentality. Do you think it was like he's a little subconscious? He thought, oh, okay, I can take away from that if I just wear something that's so oversized, I look thin. Or do you think that he just needed room to make a, a, a boom boom in his big boy pants? 
But watching him waddle back and forth in these, and I was like, God damn, those are big. You can choose a ready guy or some celestial boys. <laughs> and I've always had bad relationships. A, when came way back, even the girl I lost my virginity to, this really beautiful half black, half Puerto Rican chick. I used to like to joke that I didn't lose my virginity, that she stole it from me. But, uh. <laughs> More than the fashion of the fedora, what really struck me on that clip is he's doing his stand-up bit in front of the restaurant, and they're talking louder than he is. They're so uninterested in the punchline to his fucking joke that they're just shouting over him. That's got to be so demoralizing. It's like the drunk guy at the party. It doesn't feel like a stand-up routine to me. It's a choice for the uh, for the patron, right? Do I want to enjoy my, uh, my fried chicken and my uh, overpriced beer, or do I want to look at this guy who's dressed like a commando up on stage? <laughs> <laughs> that thinks he's an extra from like fucking Rambo or something with his green beret hat. Uh, tell a joke about Puerto Ricans. I don't know. I think I'll eat. Fuck him. I'm actually shocked that anyone watches his show. Like, I don't get like his jokes just don't, don't land. Um, I don't think his audience even finds him funny. I don't see, I've never seen I've watched, you know, Nightwave here and there to like see like, oh, what's he talking about or whatever. No one LOLs in his chat even. So not, he was not funny in stand-up, but I guess the reason he's doing the live stuff is because you can't hear the bomb. You can't hear the bombing, whereas on stand-up, you do. With Mersh placed perilously on the outskirts of an industry he was so far struggling to penetrate, his comedic ambitions would not yet be deterred. A performance at 2007's X-Fest Music Festival would see what could only be described as a badly dressed J.C. Denson cosplayer record his greatest comedic achievement to date, distracting a crowd of pissed up adolescents from the onstage set assembly behind him. I went through hell, man. I actually got drunk last night, blacked out in the show. My car broke down in a jack shack. No joke, man. It was really hot. I actually had to end up beating a hooker to death with a tennis shoe just to steal a car and get to fucking x -Fest tonight. So uh, it was a lot of work. So basically, the, the owner of this gig was like, listen, we just need to drown out the sound of construction in the background. They don't have to be funny. We just need them to talk. He could claim that I've got, uh, what is it? So X-Fest, Music Festival, uh, 5,000 people, 10,000 people that are forced to listen uh, to me losing my virginity to a black girl who stole it. Get it? That's a punchline. But with this career highlight once again meandering into the same sea of nothingness he had spent his adult life splashing around in, a bright light would start flashing above his thinning dome. With a long line of East Coast comedians owing their success to XM Radio's Opie and Anthony, Mersh would redirect his efforts towards working all angles in appearing on the show. He would look towards ONA's infamous roster of brain-damaged jesters and bottom-feeding stunt boys, before finally honing in on fan favourite Daniel Bobo Curlin. And having agreed to ferry Bobo to and from the studio completely free of charge in some frantic grab Akumia's vampiric coattails, Mersh would take his place as the ONA's resident retard's resident retard. So you're going all the way to a frat house in Buffalo That's to do a gig? That's hundred bucks. For a hundred dollars, but you have to get yourself there. I'm, I'm being driven there by a friend of mine who, who's also a friend of Heather Heights. His name is Mersh. Yeah, he, yeah. Mersh. Thank you, you've all, been great, you've all been a great audience. And now, let me introduce you to my next comedian. He's also a lovable fuck up. Give it up for Long Island, Mersh! Yeah! Uh, just a heads up, I'm not going up yet. So that was... while, while I appreciate the effort, Bobo. Uh, Heather's gonna bring your next comic up. Uh, Mersh did an amazing job. I'm shocked this guy hasn't had his own Comedy Central special yet. Somebody needs to call Comedy Central. Book, get this guy. Tell them it's about like, this uh, guy named Mersh. He should have his own special. Terry Bozio used to do that. I remember he remember seeing like a Jimi Hendrix tribute. He, he should has Mersh should have his own special. His As a matter of fact, he should be he headlining you know, he like in uh, in Caroline's, and maybe someone should tell Vinnie Brand about him because he should also be headlining at the Stress Factory. I think that speaks to the desperation, doesn't it? Like it's not just that bitterness that's caked in there, but like a real fucking desperation to try to do anything to get noticed. I don't know how being the chauffeur for a retard is gonna, <laughs> like how did he envision that playing out? Like they were gonna go, oh my God. 
what a beautiful Mercury. Please come on stage. Please come up into the studio so we can hear about your fucking car home. His name is Bobo and he's retarded. And you're the retarded guy that people shit on chauffeur. Like, e like even if his stand up was fucking pristine 10 out of 10, they still wouldn't respect them. With a stand-up career in such a sad state that even the gift of featuring for Doug Stanhope barely moves the needle, Mersh would make some necessary arrangements to facilitate a full-time return to comedy. By December 2011, the nomadic gagster was back in New York, ready to work the stage and ready to hurt your feelings. And having followed his first recorded effort menace to sobriety with a one-hour comedy album in Killjoy, he was fully prepared to take the comedy circuit by storm. Such was his fervent enthusiasm that Mersh would start posting his own motivational pep talks to his Facebook feed, with one in particular stating how, I've realized lately how much I've lost in the last few years, and I'm taking it all back. All of it. I've got raw natural fucking talent and have lacked ambition up to this point for whatever reason, be it fear, depression, or just a desire to have an excuse to be a failure. That changes now. And if anyone gets in my way this time, I will cut your fucking throat. After just over a year back on the jocular saddle, a tidal wave of unearned confidence would sweep clear above his 5'7 frame, with Mersh at this point for some bizarre reason actively gatekeeping the comedic profession. He would arrogantly post a response to an innocuous Tumblr meme asking why the hell aren't we all comedians, by listing four ways in which he is more unique, talented, original and ultimately funnier than most people. In the ensuing months after posting this comment, Mersh would give up on stand-up comedy altogether. Stand-up comedy is a dead art form and he ch attempted resuscitating the dead art form by blowing the lung air of Jim Norton into it. And um, I don't know if you know this, but stand-up comedy already has a Jim Norton, so it probably did not need a second one. He's just not funny. He's just absolutely... I watched a few of his uh, stand-up specials and they're just miserable. They're absolutely miserable. The personal affairs of Mike Sheely very much reflected the dire condition of his professional endeavors, with his life in a continuous state of homeless flux. He would play out the last of his golden years sleeping in the back of his Mercury Grand Marquis claiming on an Opie and Anthony message board that you can't ask for a better homeless car. On the rare occasion he could meet the insurmountable economic burden of a cell phone plan, usually having harvested the pity of charitable well-wishers, Mersh could be found posting his financial hardships to his social media feed. I never sold I needed a before I thought I could get by by myself. No, I know I just can't take it anymore. And with humble heart on bended knee, I'm begging you. Oh my god, golly gee gosh, guys. Digging in a dumpster again. Posted on Facebook, though. Hey guys, I'm homeless. I'm on a fucking uh, whack bag. Hey guys, I'm home. Did you know that I'm homeless? I need to tell you for the 400th time. By the way, here's a PayPal link, you know, completely unrelated. Just such sympathy whoring. Fuck off. In one post, he would comment, just another fucking week of being homeless. Whilst another posed the question, what do you do when you are broken jobless? And when not attempting to shoehorn what remained of his comedic prowess into another night of free weed, he'd spiral deeper into a whirlpool of nihilistic self-importance, even going as far as to entertain the occasional suicidal gesture in this hapless quest for positive validation. In one post, he'd discuss how he understands suicide in a totally non-emo way, before asking readers not to make it all about you should he leave this mortal coil. In another post, he'd warn his readership to never have dreams they don't come true. Never set goals ain't gonna happen. Listen, you should just give up now, or you'll be living in a mercury eating out of dumpsters. <laughs> All right, thanks for the fucking pep talk. Oh, so tragic, I might shoot myself. By the way, donate here. 
whilst another lamented his official lack of employment before what appeared to be a blatant case of suicide begging. With his comment, trying not to kill myself send booze, preceded by an actual PayPal link. And with a feed infected with your typical infantile self-destruction one might expect from Alkaline Trio, Mersh would be left channeling the social media activity of a teenage scene girl. You know what I really like is 18 people gave an emoji rating to him talking about killing himself, but only one to the, <laughs> the post about giving him money. Did everybody, even the people who know him, shit on him? Are those sarcastic, sad face <laughs> emojis in response to him? From what I've heard, what I understand is a lot of these top level guys, they all struggle too. A lot of them are high school dropouts, didn't go to college. You know, they, they didn't have rich parents or anything. Mersh didn't have any parents. So imagine how wealthy he's going to be in the future, considering the amount of struggle he's gone through. It's honestly, it's inspiring. Uh, your boy Mersh has had a very hard life and I've got some really fucked up stories. I'm just gonna say it again. The homie Mersh is a little bit broke right now. Um, and uh, it's actually been like, oh cool, Jeff Omar is in the, in the chat. He's a, he's a potato N word like myself. Maybe he can understand uh what i'm going through but i really haven't had a drink in like over a week um and everything's all fucked so you know like i said paypal.me forward slash merch comedy wanna hook a motherfucker up you know what i mean um i don't know and uh you want to just hook me up personally i got paypal.me forward slash merch comedy uh, that's always cool. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna shill again. My personal PayPal, paypal.me forward slash Merch Comedy. Um, if you wanna help us out, help me out, uh, you know, maybe kick in a couple bucks since I'm being a goddamn burden here. Life for Mersh would continue descending further into disrepair, with his latest self-imposed cock-up resulting in a DUI and a subsequent forfeiture of his driver's license. No longer able to ferry around the handicapable leftovers of Shock Jock Radio, he would instead be forced to wait until December 2012 to recommence his long overdue rebuilding process. With his license now returned, the wall-eyed vagrant would direct his efforts towards the purchasing of his next motorized abode. But as a 29-year-old neat with the employability of a child grooming smackhead, Mersh would need a little help. So really when he's saying I got my license back, he means I got the keys to my house back, basically. <laughs> I have a fucking bedroom to sleep in again. An audacious fundraising effort seeking $1,200 would be set up using popular web begging platform GoFundMe. With reward tiers promising such things as Twitter plugs, ad reads, and even an interview with the Duke of Douchebaggery himself, it didn't take long for the first wave of sympathy donos to trickle in. His GoFundMe description was practically drenched in the sort of shameless desperation of a bus stop junkie. And with a pitiful sob story blaming his never-ending series of monumental fuck-ups on the lack of an effective support system, it's a little hard to sympathise. He would claim how he never quite recovered from his financial and personal issues, before pledging to break the cycle of dysfunction, bad decisions and bad luck. And having allegedly quit smoking and paid off all his parking fines, congratulations, Mersh would offer you his sealed guarantee that there will be no more excuses and no more whining. And despite his entire gambit reliant on the unrequited charity of gullible fools, he would cover his bases regardless, with a specific request of prospective contributors stating, no bashing, no shitty opinions, and no trolling. So three whole weeks, nothing but Facebook posts saying buy me a car. Hey guys, I'm gonna be so responsible. Listen, my life's gonna turn around once you buy me this $1,200 car. Oops, crashed into a wall after getting fucking drunk. I'm just a fuck up, aren't I? Take a fucking cab, bro. What are you doing? How does he do this? How, I, I don't even know if I should blame him or blame the people giving him the money. Well, I think he realized at a certain point that he has to at least sort of pretend that it's not complete charity. And that's when the grift came in. This sudden desire to extend his tyrannosaural arms, grab life by the horns and finally take some responsibility, despite dedicating large parts of his GoFundMe description alleviating himself of the blame, would almost immediately be undermined by his own seemingly boundless stupidity. After just one year behind the wheel of his newly crowdfunded Beggarmobile, Mersh would involve himself in yet another intoxicated fender bender, and with it yet another arrest for driving under the influence. 
with a car he had dedicated a month brazenly scrounging for now damaged beyond repair and an updated criminal record, Mersh had hit rock bottom. Not only had he betrayed the trust of his benevolent donors, he had completely sabotaged any sign of breaking his aforementioned cycle of dysfunction. But the true extent of his bold-faced effrontery would soon reveal itself, with Mersh setting up a second GoFundMe page titled I Screwed Up, this time seeking over $3,000. A tweet stating that shit keeps getting worse and worse, your help is appreciated, would link the page to the flock of susceptible rubes encircling his Facebook feed. And with a description that simply read, yup, you know what happened, blah, blah, it's an undeniable miracle that he was somehow able to raise over $500, double dipping into the pockets of the same exact benefactors that had seen their previous investment seized by Florida Highway Patrol. But by far the most shocking aspect of this entire saga was seeing Mersh use a wristband from the medical unit where he was on actual suicide watch as a fucking donation perk. Yep, you know what happened, blah blah. Is that really the fucking description he wrote? And why is it twice, the, three times the amount of the first one? You could have one of a kind wristband from the medical unit where I was on suicide watch! <laughs> ah! Oh god, he has no shame, does he? Thanks for your charity, faggots! <laughs> Do it again! Give me more money, I'm gonna drive it into a wall! Ten bucks is life-changing to Mersh. It's nothing to anybody else he knows. So they just throw it to him, you know? It's, you throw a bum $10 and you wouldn't even feel that weird about it. I don't get why people would donate to that behavior because you know it's gonna happen again and again and again. How many cars, how many, how many GoFundMe's can someone do until you're like, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna donate to this. Okay, so let me piece this together. He spends three fucking weeks spamming anybody who happens to even look his way, begging for a car that he wants to live out of because that's his fucking house. He gets shit-faced drunk from all the profit he made selling coke to gay dudes he's giving hand jobs to because he's a rent boy. And then he gets, he just drives it right, probably to a comedy club that rejected him. And then he goes back to them, hey guys, a turtle fuck up here wouldn't want me to kill myself. I need another car. You want to grift some people? There's some retard conservatives out there sitting there like lap dogs, just waiting for you to throw a bone. I was going to say bone, but you know what I mean. They were dying. They're ready to lap it up. And I think at that point, Mersh really found his true calling, which has always been panhandling. It was around this time that Mersh's living situation entered a period of relative permanence, with Royce Lopez, a Captain Pugwashian Cuban man he had met on a cringe humor message board, inviting Mersh to stay indefinitely at his Floridian home. And with Royce's partner Marie now faced with the reality of sharing her dwelling with some deadbeat drifter with a history of alcohol abuse, it would take a great deal of buttering up to finally get her on side. Eventually, the three would combine their meager talents in putting together a podcast for the More Like Radio Network, titled The Fifth Circle, a likely reference to Royce and Marie's rather morbid but completely genuine fascination with ritualistic devil worship. I wish I was joking. Wait, 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 because earlier, Evan, and I will isolate this to prove my point, you said you didn't have any shots. Now we're up to two. Evan, which one is well, it? <laughs> better get your, I'm just saying. Better get your story straight. Now you got two different stories circulating the internet. I didn't think I was going to have to. It's going to escalate to, okay, I had seven Heineken. It'll sound like something. It'll sound like one of my nights. All right, look, I had like. 18 shots yeah. and 15 does, beers. Just keep talking over. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Keep... You're not circumcised, right, Ernie? Yes, I am, actually. Bullshit, you're not Cuban. Hang up. Good. Hang awesome. up. Get out. Get yeah, this fucker out of here. People. Yeah, next thing you're going to tell me you wear socks. Oh, now you wear socks with your fucking I'm going to high-five you through the uh, mic there, uh, Ernie. Way to go for socks. No, man, it's, it's, it's so hard to wear I'm socks with sandals, it. you know what I mean? Or nah, bracelet. nah, forget it. Forget it. Hey, Cuban. Fucking poser, I don't want to talk to him. Royce will take what he can get. When he's been pretending to be big time radio man, he's wearing his big boy radio pants every day and he's telling his wife, one day I'll make it, I swear. Then, uh, yeah, he's going to take anybody, like, Mersh is coming in lying, going like, I used to work with Opie and Anthony. That must sound so exciting to Royce. He probably still thinks about that.
In December 2011, Mersh had somehow landed himself an exciting opportunity, working the door at a local Tampa strip club. Swiftly becoming general manager due largely to the dire economic and operational mess left by his predecessor. He was now in receipt of a modest but regular paycheck, and it didn't take long for Mersh to start flexing that monetary muscle. His sudden change in attire would reflect his brand new sleaze aesthetic. With an ostentatious gold watch and a snazzy dress suit, a real hit amongst his beat-up roster of $2 pole grinding whores. But after just two years of full-time employment, he would be unceremoniously fired by the owner of Gold Club Tampa, Mike Tomkovich. With his newly acquired financial lifeline now severed, a panic-stricken Mersh would go on the legal offensive, alleging that his firing was in fact a race-related whistleblower case due to his opposition of Tomkovich's discrimination against black employees. Mersh would claim that he was instructed to thin the herd of non-white dancers, adding that Tomkovich directed him to charge black entertainers up front to perform, while similarly situated Caucasian employees were not charged until after their performance. Mersh would even suggest that after hearing he had hired a black female to work the door, the club owner remarked, fantastic, now I have an N-word door girl. All in all, the frivolity of this lawsuit represented some incredibly tribal behavior indeed just from a realistic perspective. Um, I don't buy any of this. So you're going to tell me the guy who's desperate to make it famous, right? Um, who is living in his mercury, uh, is barely scraping by, always begging for PayPal money, uh, you know, has to deal drugs to, for supplemental income, finally finds a stable position working at a place where he's a fucking manager. And he's going to be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Basically, I worked for a chain of clubs, uh, strip clubs, and uh, I was the chain manager. I was fired for political reasons. I was fired because uh, I basically there were I was being asked to do things that are illegal. And uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm a fucking soldier, dude. I don't have problems doing illegal shit for money. In this case, I was asked at a certain point to treat, uh, basically to thin the herd, so to speak, of my black and Hispanic employees. Uh, the impression that came from my owner at the time was that I had too many working for me and he didn't want to be that kind of club. So I was asked to, you know, basically partake in certain measures that were discriminatory that would cause these people uh, to not want to be there and to quit, uh, basically force them out the door. And because of my refusal to take part in that, uh, those policies, I was fired. Having now self-identified as an opportunistic snitch, Mersh would stake everything on the outcome of the Sheely vs. SE Show Club's lawsuit. And with the defendant's motion to dismiss denied by Judge James S. Moody Jr., things were initially looking up for the embittered informant. And with a potential severance package of $637,000 on the table, the prospect of genuine life-changing money would no doubt have sent Merch into a full-blown ocular tailspin. However, after three years of bitter legal wranglings, the case was ultimately thrown out, leaving an exasperated Mike Sheely not only completely penniless, but with a well-deserved reputation as a litigious tattletale. And as for the fundamental question of whether the suddenly altruistic Mersh truly cared for the working conditions of black sex workers, or had simply sought a self-serving opportunity to leverage the alleged discrimination towards ethnic minorities into a hefty personal settlement all for himself is something we'll never truly know for sure. This is fucking with my mind. Again, he's ahead of the curve. So he's basically trying to cancel culture for racism, maybe five or six years a little too early. Anybody that knows me knows I don't do illegal things, said the dude that would post on Facebook about selling coke to gay guys. You all know me, Mr. Drive My Car Into The Wall, a drug dealer. When he made me do those mean things against those innocent black girls, that's where I drew the line. I uh, found out today that uh, my lawsuit was in fact thrown out by a federal judge. Uh, we were not given a trial. We were not given any of the things that were promised by the system that we believe in. Um, so yeah, it was uh, no trial, no jury, no nothing. Uh, just a federal judge who, for whatever, for one reason or another, didn't like me. So, needless to say, four years, a lot of fighting, and uh, on a whim, it's all gone. So, today's probably been one of the worst days I've had in years, finding out this news today. Uh, 
but I am, needless to say, in a bit of a jam right now. Uh, you, know, you do a whistleblower case like this, and you hope that after four years of fighting that you will at least get a chance to say your piece. Um, I was not afforded that opportunity, but as a result, I now have to suffer from the the repercussions of being known as somebody who's a whistleblower or a snitch or, you know, or a litigious, a litigious person. After three long years of watching his hairline gradually disappear behind the vista of his ever-growing scalp, the theoretical nest egg teeming with delusions of expected wealth had finally shattered. And with barely a hint of a reliable income stream on the horizon, it was back to the old drawing board for Mersh as he negotiated his next move. With the formidable weight of paying his own rent and utilities outsourced to his satanic sugar daddy Royce, Mersh was given the luxury to once again try his hand at performative comedy. And following the inception of what appeared to be his very own production company, he would commence work on stitching together a potential homemade TV pilot. Jobber would see Mersh get to live out his ultimate teenage fantasy, playing dress up on camera as his favourite wrestlers. A six-minute promotional trailer poorly shot in Royce's living room would advertise itself as a comedic mockumentary based around the misadventures of amateur wrestling. Aside from the substandard production quality across the board, the pilots were seemingly lacking any sort of tangible script, leaving the so-called actors uncomfortably stumbling over one another in a scene not too dissimilar from your local Andram society. Ultimately, as the centerpiece of his freshly established enterprise Killjoy Productions, this was an embarrassing mess for all involved. And despite Mersh creating yet another failed GoFundMe for this would-be abomination, he would quickly and rather mercifully abandon the project altogether. Judgment Day. The end of the world. Is it really the end of the world, though? It's Judgment Day, right? But hasn't Judgment Day come before the yeah. end of the world? Judgment Day is before the Judge end of the world. And then, well, you know what? It depends on what you believe. Right. Judge because, judgment. But then, like, when has everyone chosen then to ascend? Oh, no. When does that happen? 144,000 people yeah. go on judgment. That's ju My point is, people are lit. These, these marks that are watching, they're going to know the difference. I can't. I, I'm not. I'm on my phone, so I can't make a little thing at the bottom. But gofundme.com forward slash jobber. Uh, if you want to see our awesome uh, wrestling project coming up, uh, we need some fucking cash, folks. So, uh, you know, make with the goddamn money faucet already, all right? GoFundMe.com forward slash jobber. Um, if you like wrestling and comedy, um, it's this is going to be good. So, um, And uh, you can, of course, uh, help us raise money to fight the globalist uh, capitalist system by uh, going to GoFundMe.com forward slash jobber uh, before it's too late. Meanwhile, one of the more unfortunate byproducts of Donald Trump's 2016 election victory saw an unprecedented explosion of online culture warriors, with just about anybody boasting a YouTube following frenetically pivoting their content towards owning those dastardly libs. And with the fifth circle drawing the sort of engagement usually reserved for Ben Glebe's political campaigns, it didn't take long for Mersh to purse those lips and start sucking on that dissident teat. Revenge of the Sis, a clever amalgamation of the left's degradation of self-identification and Star Wars, would be Mersh and Royce's sacrificial lamb to the alt-right Templo mayor. And despite the podcast's early struggles, they would go on to attract a small but oddly enthusiastic following. As a show leading a full-scale media insurgency, ROTC would advertise itself as an anti-censorship free speech sanctuary, with the tagline, We're Not Sorry, underscoring their radical non-conformity. And as a news talk show with plenty of jokes to help you swallow those red pills with ease, the message from your 5-1 giant killing anti-hero is simple. Die laughing. It's literally the last middle finger you can ever give to this world. I'm basically juggling around the idea of leaving this industry and focusing on bringing you guys content pretty much around the clock. Um, live content, videos, archived stuff, a uh, possible Twitch show. Um, but most importantly, this would be bringing you Revenge of the Sis, which is the program we've been working on uh, daily. The reason I'm doing this video is because, you know, you guys know I post a lot of stuff. I'm pretty, pretty out there. Um, I 
at times can be pretty amusing if I'm not tooting my own horn. And, uh, you know, I've done comedy radio. I did it professionally at one point, and uh, I sort of let myself get sidetracked with a lot of bullshit. And part of that reason is because years of doing stand-up and podcasting and hearing people say, well, when are you doing a show? And then never going to shows. It's fucking difficult. We really need your support. Um, If a bunch of neo-Nazis and a bunch of LARPers walking around with sticks and a bunch of Antifa idiot faggots can fucking all make all this money and, uh, you know, off of hate, We hope that you guys will support us as we try to venture into this whole thing uh, with a little bit more love and humor. No, their their plants that anybody in Antifa that hits somebody is actually part has been put there by the Trump administration to hit people to make Antifa look bad. Dude, it's I heard the same thing when that uh, James Alex Field kid hit that fucking crowd of people. Yeah. And, uh, I heard that too. It was immediately it's controlled opposition, bro. It's not us. And you're like, really? So you can you so you can vouch for the thousands of people there. What as a nice guy, what am I supposed to do? Tell me. Let us know. There's no way you can't reach us. You know how to reach us, folks. If you're on the left, explain to me. If I can't dress my kid up like an Indian, and now you're going to get mad because if, if we get to the, that's where this alt right circle comes from. That's where the white nationalists, where these angry kids are coming from. They can't dress up like a Native American. They can't dress up like a Mexican with a sombrero and some pistoleros. They can't do any of that because it's appropriation. Give your kids hormones. It's no big deal. They can always change back when they're 14. <laughs> They'll have enough penis left. Hey, if your son's got a big enough penis, he can have four gender reassignments, eh? As long as you got enough, as long as you got enough skin in it. Despite Mersh's pinned proclamation that it's a scary time to be a comedian, streamlabs.com slash nightwave radio, he would refuse to be discouraged. In an attempt to continue dunking on the metropolitan swarms of gun-shy libtards, he would create a parody campaign titled Guns for Tards. For just $7.99, this prank by mail service would send a letter on your behalf to any SJW anonymously, thanking them for their $75 donation. The letter would further explain how this donation had been used to arm a mentally challenged person in their neighborhood. And having set up an official Guns for Tards domain, a dedicated PayPal portal and yet another GoFundMe page, hopes of imagined riches would send Mersh's peepers into peak spasm. What had started as a relatively amusing prank was now being incessantly spammed midway through every ROTC episode, in what appeared to be an explicit grab at that precious conservative coin. His persistent avarice would even see him give out discount codes and two-for-one specials on what is essentially, given the customer has no idea whether this letter has even been sent, a prank without a payoff. Not even a manufactured censorship war against GoFundMe following their removal of a firearm-related fundraiser from their platform could prevent this palm-rubbing scheme from inevitable disaster. It appeared the only tards in this entire transaction were those who willingly paid $8 for Mersh to post a fucking letter. Do you like pranks, guns, and jokes about retarded people? Well, so do we, but odds are your liberal snowflake friend doesn't. How would you like an easy, cost-effective way of screwing with that friend anonymously without losing your Twitter account? Guns for Tards is the perfect way to trigger SJW anonymously through the mail. For a low fee, your target will receive a beautifully designed professional mailer from our fictional Guns for Tards charity, containing a thank you letter for their donation. We have these plans laid out for folks out there uh, to donate money and uh, to help out. Uh, as you know, with, with what happened in Chicago, we can't stand for that to happen again. So uh, hashtag gun for, guns for tards. Uh, keep it going out there. We have a war with GoFundMe. Uh, we do believe that these Zionist uh, Jew bankers took our money. Uh, so for those of you folks that uh, did not get refunds, we're going to try to look into that. It's really getting out of control here, folks. Gunsfortards.com. 
Gunsforcharge.com. Defend the rights of these people here to own firearms, folks. It's very serious out there. Fake Alex Jones signing off. So we're going to own the libs by mailing them shit about guns? Is that... <laughs> Is that what I'm getting from this? It could have been a funny joke if it was just a Twitter hashtag and probably not four tards, you know, make it a little more believable. Just like some, you know, parody, satire, right? With no money aspect, you know, be funny for a day. But like that was his big money maker, huh? That That's all good and well to try to troll, but you don't get to see anyone's reaction. The joke is about retarded people, but the only audience merch had to do the joke to were retarded people. Okay, so let me get this. So he sets this up knowing nobody's gonna, like this is the stupidest fucking thing ever. But then he appeals to people and says, no, no, you don't understand, it's wildly popular, but we need to expand it to deal with the volume. That's what I need you to donate for. Not buy the product, but expand my ability to sell the product. Now imagine you're fucking, I don't know, Arnold Nicotina or whoever was around back then. You're one of these retards, Tiara Priest, and you're sitting there and you're going, oh, the joke is about retarded people. And then there's that moment where you, you know, the quantum leap, the door opens, the mirror's there, you look into it and you realize, wait, I'm retarded? As a new media enterprise underwritten entirely by the financial goodwill of their viewership, Revenge of the Sis would need to grow exponentially in order to pass this off as an actual career. Fortunately for your new heroes of the Imperium, Nickelodeon's Dan Schneider was at this point nostril deep in preteen feet. And despite opening old fecal wounds for Mersh personally as a child abuse survivor, he was keen to capitalize nonetheless. After linking up with an open secrets Gabe Hoffman, their wall-to-wall -wall Schneider coverage would reap some rather sizable rewards indeed, with regular views in the hundreds of thousands. And as a self-professed independent journalist soliciting right-wing gratuities on the fringes of relevance, engaging with a decorated filmmaker like Hoffman, a man who single-handedly took down Brian Singer, to expose the epidemic of rampant Hollywood degeneracy was just the leg up Mersh was looking for. But despite dedicating weeks of talk show real estate towards Dan Schneider's affinity for pre-adolescent toads, the kingmakers of the alt-right would continue to ignore them. And with Mike Cernovich having seemingly benefited personally and financially from promulgating the infamous Pizzagate affair, Mersh would concentrate the entirety of his pent-up bitterness towards the convicted domestic abuser. What I directed him towards is I'm like, look, basically a lot of people at Nickelodeon have been arrested and they were prior or whatever. So I basically gave him all of the names that ended up in his thing, um, which got like maybe 100,000 views, fine. He wanted to talk about Nickelodeon pedophiles. Um, I tried to tell him where to find it and like that didn't work well and I had to just spoon feed all of it to him when it was just easily internet searchable. Um, it was really annoying. I did that for him. You know, he barely credited me, whatever, I didn't care. Yeah, finally got Gabe Hoffman on. This is Thanks awesome. Thanks for calling we've been, in, uh, bud. We've been, uh, sure. I, I've been a fan no of yours, obviously, since an open secret, but also when I saw you on uh, on InfoWars with Alex, who we were just watching. You were just watching the hilarious yeah. clip of. So I think more people are starting to kind of realize what's going on. Um, I think we've got a lot of attention on this, and that's what I was touching on. So as a result of that, uh, you know, you got guys like Gabe Hoffman on Infowars saying, Google Dan Schneider and feet. Well, uh, if you Google Dan Schneider and feet, <clears throat> Royce and I were pretty much the first, uh, <clears throat> the first show to really approach this topic. He saw me on Infowars. He saw my film making, you know, headlines around the world on Drudge Report and other places and being on TV all around the world. And you know, hit me up a DM, gave me a sob story about how they were poor and just starting out. And, you know, could I please come on their, you know, podcast, which had like uh, maybe a thousand people at the time subscribing or whatever. And I did. And then when he asked me to keep him up on Hollywood child sex abuse stuff, I did. He asked me for info about the Dan Schneider stuff. And I gave it to him with all the Nickelodeon pedophiles. And he used that, and you know, he got his first video that maybe 100,000 views happened or something. But fucking listen, we sent enough of this shit, it got retweeted enough, people are talking about it, so fucking, I wanna know why, why the fuck Mike Cernovich doesn't give a shit about this? What's the matter, is the fucking gorilla mindset not apply to protecting children, Mike? Huh? Is it because preteens aren't a target demographic to shill your piece of shit book to? 
it's such a, a, a naive miscalculation. Like Pasobic, Loomer, uh, Cernovich, and all of them, right? Milo, I'd even throw in there, and a couple others. Um, this would have been 2017-ish. Like that's all, they're all rising because of the mega shit. I'm sure none of them want to start talking about kids getting fucked in Hollywood. It's going to clash with talking about how based Donald Trump is. Oh, by the way, let's talk about kids getting ass fucked. It's a little bit off topic for what they're trying to sell. You know, and you can look at any of his articles from like that time frame on his website. I mean, he would fail a sixth grade writing class. Like they're literally all just run on sentences. Um, it's almost impossible to read. And so he wasn't doing anything that was either original or good. A lot of other people were doing it, but in his own brain, he thought it was original and he thought that it deserved to be promoted by all of these people like Loomer, Cernovich, Pasovic. And then when they wouldn't, he decided he would hate those people. Um, but of course, if they had actually ever promoted his stuff, he would have loved them. We're putting work into this show. We're getting frozen out by multiple people. We can't even get a fucking retweet from these so-called peers of ours, okay? Gabe Hoffman from An Open Secret, one of the only guys who has actually followed up, retweeted, make sure yeah. his appearance was seen, that he went on our show. The rest of you fucking people, you have no respect. Stop treating us like we're clowns, okay? Because we're only at 2,500 subs now. We are going to blow past you people. Mark my words, and we will not be so fucking kind to you when we do. Mersh's unbridled hostility towards Cernovich was at such a heightened state that even those who happened to agree with the date rape advocate on unrelated matters were simply dead to him. And despite playing an integral role in ROTC's unmasking of a corpulent podophile, it only took Gabe Hoffman agreeing with Cernovich on Guardians of the Galaxy's James Gunn for Mersh to completely lose his mind. Gabe's suggestion was that given the recent bout of sex abuse scandals plaguing the entertainment industry, in addition to Gunn's best friend Houston Huddleston pleading guilty to child porn possession, the prudent approach for the studio was to suspend the director until more was known. After all, this was a man who had not only tweeted such things as I like it when little boys touch me in my silly place and I fuck the shit out of the little pussy boy next to me, but had even hosted a paedophile themed event with self-admitted child abuser James Uringa in attendance. Mercy's response was to stream a tirade of deranged abuse directed towards Gabe, attacking his supposed tribal alignment to an insidious, parasitic, disingenuous, rootless and international cabal of people who have very terrible tendencies. And having instructed his recently obtained Wignap following to spam Gabe's Twitter responses with a bombardment of inflammatory fed posts, it didn't take long for the inevitable ban hammer to strike. When the James Gunn thing came along, that's just what I did. I just said, hey, this is what's happening. I never called for Gunn to be like permanently like career ended, canceled. I just said like, hey, he's got a lot of these tweets. He's a Disney director in charge of films where there are minors working. And by the way, a bunch of these tweets people are looking at that are about child sex. They're going to Houston Huddleston, his like best friend, who actually had just gotten jailed for child porn. So I'm like, look, Disney, you need to fire him now. You know, I didn't call him a pedophile or anything or say he was guilty, but I'm like, you know, there's a lot of smoke here and, and you really ought to investigate. Take six months, see what happens. And actually that's exactly what Disney did. They fired him and then they investigated and you know, then they, they rehired him and everything was fine. So in a weird way, Mersh is defending the person being accused of being a pedophile. <laughs> He's defending James Gunn. If if Mike or if Mike Cernovich was fighting with Dan Schneider, would Mersh suddenly be defending Dan Schneider? He didn't like who else agreed with me. Because I didn't really side with Cernovich or anything. It was just Cernovich had a point of view. I had a point of view. Sobic had a point of view. Our points of view were pretty much aligned. And Mersh didn't share that point of view, which was like, fine, whatever. If you're not familiar, which you should be, James Gunn was fired from the Walt Disney Company uh, two days ago, day ago, um, after old tweets uh, from his Twitter account started resurfacing where he was talking about touching little boys and making all these rape jokes and just a lot of effed up stuff, a lot of deep, dark stuff. I don't think we can expect any real answers. I don't know if I'm necessarily convinced that the man is a monster. And this firing stems from some tweets that have surfaced and have been making the rounds recently about some of the most just disgusting stuff I've ever heard. 
Uh, I mean, I, w I would show you the tweets here, but they are so offensive that this video could get flagged. Um, I would I would link to them down below, but I think you should find them on your own term. But we we're talking about some really, really disgusting stuff. He found something to disagree with on the James Gunn thing, and, you know, then it was just mask off, like Jew hater and hating on me and lying about everything. Press one in the chat if uh, if you are familiar with the fact that I tend to have a bit of a distrust for the Jews. Press two if somebody telling you that I might not like Jews would be a complete mind-blowing fact to you. Holy shit, really? Is he? I didn't know he said those things about Jews before. Gabe Hoffman, you insincere motherfucker. You always knew how I felt about city folk. You know that I truly know in my heart that you people are insidious. You are parasitic and disingenuous, rootless, international cabal of people who only serve their own. You have very terrible tendencies. How can he have such vitriol, right? Uh, like, oh, I, I hate, I hate, I hate the Jews. When he was desperate to work with the guy in the first place, did he suddenly discover he was Jewish after the fight? I had no idea he was such a crazy Jew hater until somebody sent me that link the very night he disagreed with me about James Gunn. And I said, oh my God, like this is a madman. Mersh's response was to once again violently swing his vestigial limbs in all directions. He would create a petition to ban notorious alt-right predator Mike Cernovich from Twitter, stating how he is a woman-abusing former men's rights activist and creepy supplement shill who is constantly posting Pizzagate conspiracies and pro-Trump vitriol on Twitter. He would even attempt to exploit the same Me Too movement he had spent years rallying against, claiming how Cernovich was recorded on tape and in blogs bragging about his rape charges, as well as his sexually predatory behaviour, before affirming that actual sexual predators shouldn't be allowed to lead justice mobs against people who sent offensive tweets. At last count, the petition would amass over 1,100 signatories, and with the attempted circulation of the hashtag BanCernovich, would represent the Meta Comedian's first coordinated deep platforming. The problem for Merch is that this entire exercise is born solely from both his concentrated antipathy towards Mike Cernovich and a likely retaliation to the suspension of his 7,000 strong Twitter account. This was quite clearly a disingenuous crusade dressed up as some sort of self-righteous expose, and given his earlier vitriol expressed towards Dan Schneider, this sudden change of tune towards potential sex abusers in show business is certainly revealing. But it's the sheer audacity of Mersh not only front-loading the petition with references to the dastardly Donald Trump and Pizzagate, but attempting to weaponize the Me Too movement just to act out his personal vendetta that showcases the very worst in this man's all-consuming resentment. It's so funny too, because I remember I brought this up the other day, because I was the one that like compiled the Cernovich dossier last year, because I was obsessed with ruining him. So even yes, like the other day we were talking about Cernovich, and somebody that was here asked, like, why do you always make that joke about him pulling his dick out on Indian girls in cabs? Like, it's a very specific joke. And I'm like, oh, Google Mike Cernovich, when in doubt, whip it out. Like, I remembered the name of the fucking blog because I hate this man. So when he gets a grudge, like, he holds on to it, huh? That's that bitterness, man. That's just hidden under that, you know what I mean? It's just kept, he barely keeps it in check. He wants success so bad so he can just fucking own people. I guess that kind of mentality makes me think that, like, this is a dude sitting on top of the world's biggest fucking uh, explosive load of bitterness. And it's just, he's waiting to pop off to tell people how wrong they were kind of thing. How about, yeah, call him out, do videos, do shows, expose him. Uh, you, For you to be the exact same, <laughs> like they start a hashtag, that's insanity. The only tweet I'll ever remember of Mersh is, the only one that sticks out in my mind. I think the first tweet I ever saw from him was how difficult it is to be a comedian out there. And I, I have a feeling, though, the second tweet after that one was, please help me deplatform Mike Cernovich. Go to petition.org and sign this. Mersh is just fueled by this bitterness and rage at, at anyone who is more successful by what he deems successful in terms of clout, in terms of money, or whether they're just like a happy person with a family. Um, he will always be 
just the most empty, broken, spiritually poor person that you could ever meet. The relative success of their Dan Schneider content saw Revenge of the Sis stuck in a perpetual paedophilic feedback loop. But with his pathway to the big boy's table obstructed by who he saw as conservative gatekeepers, Mersch would change tack. Internet Bloodsports, a debate hosting community popularised by Second Amendment advocate Andy Worski, was seen by Mersch as a venue that could rapidly grow ROTC's heavily botted subscriber base. But with the who's who of IBS putting the Webster Park Waddler on a permanent pay no mind list, it would take a rehearsed, seethe ridden tirade for Mersch to finally be noticed. After an evening of motivational shadow boxing, he would appear on an episode of The Morning Kumite, a blood sports battleground hosted by a paraplegic redskin with his bearded fuck pig Royce, ready to give Andy Wawawawski a good old fashioned talking to. But with Royce calling Styx X and Hammer 666 a pedophile completely unprovoked, the show would naturally descend into hyperactive chaos. Mersh had found screenshots on 4chan's lefty pole board, suggesting the leather-clad cringe tuber was engaging romantically with underage fans in his YouTube comment sections. But with only one of the more innocuous comments on show verifiable through archive records, it was called into question whether any of what they provided was real, especially given the highly questionable source. But with Royce digging his cankled hoof into the turf before engaging in unstable bouts of defensive hog squeals, it took sticks turning up to finally set the record straight. It appeared the screenshots were likely doctored by editing the webpage's source code, and having been uploaded to the same leftist community that had been harassing sticks for years, it was pretty cut and dry what was going on. In crippling fear of an actual defamation suit, an overly apologetic Mersch and Royce would agree to sing Stick's happy birthday, sending the Kumite's frenzied chat into a collective fit of hysteria. For the boys, whose entire moniker is We're Not Sorry, this represented a bitterly humiliating conclusion to their single foray into internet blood sports. One thing we could all agree on is we all fucking hate pedophiles. Can we at least, we could all unite. Oh yeah, yeah, no, they deserve a bullet. Oh you know? man, they, we've got a 12 hour stream on that from like this day three weeks ago. <laughs> I would have loved it. Like, just oh, it was some shit. It was some shit. Uh, we caught it. There was a guy who was in here who was saying all kinds of shit and then lied about sharing pictures of a 15 year old that he was planning to hook up with and then we busted him out on it. That was so annoying. You God, guys were I talking about sticks? Is that uh, what you're that talking about? That was a destiny. Fucking well, Steve Bonnell. That's a different YouTube pedophile. Destiny, Stick, I, I hypocrite maybe. I don't know. Yeah, so I hypocrite. Names. There's another so one. Many names. Yeah. Uh, they're I'll... saying they're getting mad about sticks. I think they're confusing your sticks with sticks, hex, and hammer. Is that who it is? I don't think they're confusing. No, anything. I don't think <laughs> they're confusing it. No? He clearly was on YouTube, and we have the screenshots to prove it. Hitting on a 15-year-old girl using things like good thing, something that beautiful is worth the wait. We have all of it. So yeah, Wait, no, this is real. Uh, you know, everybody in the chat wants proof of sticks and you know, the screenshots and stuff. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. For the for the 12 people out of the 1300 here who do want to look at you guys' stuff, you should link your stuff in the chat. And I got yeah, this, link it. and I got some of this info from uh, this dude by the name of Totally Not Andrew Anglin on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it. it uh, I'll show. I'll, I'll link it. You know what? I'll, I'll link all the stuff here in a second after we pop off. But I do have a link of all the screenshots and all the stuff. Yeah, we even I, talked I about actually, it on our show with the screenshots on the screen. You can get that to them. I have to actually jump off. I want to thank you guys for having me. This is Merch from ROTC. Thank you for having me on. Uh, you guys are, uh, uh, as Elliot Roger would say, supreme gentlemen. These morons who who, who screen cap these things, they didn't think to fucking archive the, all this stuff. So only like one of them. I could only find an archive of one of them. But he definitely did comment on one of her videos. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the was that the comment you were showing me earlier though? Because yeah. that was pretty yeah. fucking innocuous. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's completely innocuous. That has to strike you as weird. If if somebody found this shit and archived one thing, why wouldn't they have archived all of it? Wouldn't they want all that fucking evidence to be able to be like, hey, look, this dude is trying to hit on this chick? No, I I, I feel you. I mean, I'm not. Look, again, I'm just Wait. saying. Are we talking about like Cause the? Because uh... I hang around the, you know, like my version of the internet, the internet that I grew up with, and the internet that I find funniest, is the one that likes to fuck with people for no reason. If there was a threat on poll right now saying, you know, oh, Mersh is a pedophile, I would be on any stream calling me out right now saying, hey, what's the deal with this? And I'd be explaining myself. There is absolutely, I have not been involved in any inappropriate 
uh, even remotely inappropriate scenarios with 15 year old girls. So if I did speak to any 15 year old in the last year, I was probably related to him on some level. I would have some sort of an explanation. I, I certainly know right now, whatever's happening as it sticks is where the situation. So at least say, hey, you know, I was fucking around, whatever. I, you know, I think she does good videos or whatever, which I doubt. The only archive I have of a comment from him is on one random video from her that says, it's difficult to maintain civility when the lamestream media inevitably declares both candidates to, or candidates to be Hitler and Stalin. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, nothing in that comment. Like, yep. I want to fuck this chick. I find this chick attractive. Every other comment so far is just an image capture. Well, the yeah, and that could have easily been doctored. And keep in mind, this is fucking lefty pool. I, I, I've seen these people run bullshit off some people, right? They're, yeah, you can't well, trust it. Shit. If he wasn't doing anything wrong, and here's the thing, if he wasn't doing anything wrong, then why did he delete them? That gets my point. If you have nothing well, to- Well, no, if, if they weren't real, how would he, if they're not okay, real comments, what is he delete? Point. Well, here's my point. They're not real. Okay, but you have as much proof that they're not real as people on poll do that they are. Regardless if they're lefty or they're right, it doesn't really matter. At, the, at this point, it, 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 the, the arguments are this. Either he did it, and that looks creepy, or it's fake, and he didn't do anything, right? Can we at least agree on that? Can we say it's fake? Well, you can't delete something that doesn't exist. I okay. mean, uh, you know what? Then you know say what? This, say it's fake. This has been up for a while. People have been hitting on this in his app messages for a long time. He's never said it was fake. If the, if this was an equivalent thread, okay, of me on Lefty Poll, and all the facts were the same, everything's unchanged except instead you deny of it, right? me. Yeah. No, I would have posted that Lefty Poll thing on my personal Facebook. I'd have been like, look at this, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah right, too. Cross dressing, he's trying to bang 15 year olds. This shit is hilarious. Let me just explain briefly. First, ROTC Media has been making hit pieces on me, Warski, and others for some time now, for a hit? couple of weeks. And, and they're treading on extremely thin ice. They're getting, no, trust me, dude, you don't want to fucking play with me. You realize how much money I make? What I can do? All right, sorry. And I just want to say, I'm probably the half of Revenge of the Sis that is actually more familiar with you, Sticks. I watch you. I'm a fan. I subscribe to you on all of my alts. Um, then why are you constantly trying to get me and Worski to respond? Is it to buff up your tiny subscriber numbers? No, let, let's just... No. <laughs> it came up. And as we cover things that are notable, again, if they're fake, they're fake. Fine. Well, then why the fuck would you even bother covering it if you don't have any... You, someone puts an image out on the internet, it's the same as me as a, as a cross-dresser from Italian B or whatever the hell it's from. Okay, perhaps I phrased this poorly. What I'm saying is, let's say this is fake, okay? And this situation were different, and if it were me, that is, to me, in my scenario, would be a hilarious thread that I would be like, holy shit, look at the fanfic being written about me. It's called Grease Monkey, dude. You can fool around with the metadata, make it look, what do you think they do with those fake tweets that Trump supposedly made? I've got one that says, oh, Hillary Clinton doesn't have a dick. I suck my own dick every day. Now it looks real enough. Uh, it's not gonna come up as, hey, this was Photoshop because they just fool around with the metadata, dude. We, no, we, no. Might be, we might be much smaller, but we put, 12 hours of work a day into our brand, just like you guys do. And look, these, you look at things with tired eyes and you're on, you know, hour 12 of day six and you fly off the handle. So I'm willing to say right now, I apologize for any miscommunication. Apology accepted. Well, I'll say, I'll say this too. Number one, because I was the one with the fucking shitty jump. I do, I will say that, uh, you know, Mike's apologizing. I'm with I will say this, this, I made a joke. It was a bad joke. Yeah. I honestly thought it was common knowledge and that was my fault. I, I apologize for, you know, whatever, maybe taking things out of context and, you know, what I- uh, And also can I, I'll, I'll apologize to Tonka. It, I, the dude, I- did, Dude, seriously, I wasn't- Yeah, seriously. I wasn't even mouthing off to you earlier. No. I was mouthing off to uh, to Andy and I apologize to both I, you First, the talk at your stream, by the way, it was never meant for you to come on and us to turn us into a free show. That was honestly swear that was not our fucking intention. At the end of the day, we, I apologize. Again, I didn't, uh, I don't think, I'm usually the more intense one in this duo, but I wasn't as tense today, but I, I apologize for however, uh, you know, this turned out. Yeah. Um, Hopefully we can just, you know, support yeah. you. Yeah, I, I mean, it's already on 4chan, so sporadically I'll probably have to fucking address it for people that don't know better, but, you know, whatever. You yeah. know what you guys should do to make up 
t- sticks for this? Sure. Uh, you guys should sing him happy birthday. Oh, that's not necessary. <laughs> you know what? You, know, you said you would punch him in the face. Now the best way to apologize would be to sing him happy birthday. I hate singing happy birthday, so I feel like this is part towards the penance. This is People probably really the worst like penance. penance. No, it's, it's you can do that in a video or something. That's okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Sticks, Hex, and Hammer, Sticks, Hex. Happy birthday to you. Hey! That, that was spirited. Jesus. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess maybe we should probably. Yeah, we'll probably make our graceful exit. We'll make our not so graceful exit. We're, we're, we're sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you assholes. <laughs> That was brutal at the end. Oh my god, I was cringing so hard. I, I, I thought the happy birthday was a good suggestion. You did, I love you, you did Sinatra. There, Sinatra. It was, it was, it was something. It was a sizable audience to have uh, watch you humiliate yourself in front of a guy you just accused of being a pedophile and getting it completely wrong. It, it feels like a common theme, right? Like it feels like everything he thinks is going to be the big jumping off moment blows up like he's got to get a brand new car from donations and then he drives it into a wall he got a job as a manager and then he's fired <laughs> he's in a lawsuit he's going to partner up with uh, was it hoffman and then it goes to shit he's going to show up on uh, a taco show to get you know publicity for the schneider videos and then he's singing happy birthday during that episode when sticks came on and we realized that he was being an idiot and then he sang the happy like he said taking the happy birthday the, like what was going through his mind was maybe there's a way we could salvage this okay you know or maybe they'll respect us for for, like, for doing this and obviously it was the complete opposite effect it was like a, oh sitting there and going happy birthday to a man that you spent the past week making fun of and you're being forced to do that at gunt point is pretty damning you pick something, right? You leave or you talk shit or you just you uh, you actually apologize. You're like, yeah, I fucked up. I'm, a, I'm an ass. But you don't you don't you don't get told fucking sing me happy birthday. And he does. And I know it bothers him, by the way. The happy birthday. It wasn't because he actually felt bad or thought that like six was innocent or whatever. He was just doing whatever it took. I don't actually think sticks, X and hammers a pedo or anything, or at least I don't have any evidence for that. Um. But if you're going to make that claim, you should probably stick by it and at the very least not sing him festive songs.